I think it's really important for young people not to feel restricted in their choices and also to be aware of the choices that are available to them and obviously the media has an incredibly important role to play in that. I think we tend to talk about science as this big kind of monolith but of course actually it's this beautiful multifaceted thing. You know, there's almost something for everybody there. And there are so many different aspects of it. You know, somebody that's going to be attracted to working in biology might be a very different person from somebody who's attracted to engineering. I suppose it's about knowing the breadth of opportunities that are out there and so anything that universities and broadcast media can do to make sure that those opportunities are visible. What is nanotechnology? Well, a report that was put together by a combination of the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering that came out last summer, identified two topics. Nanoscience is the study of phenomena and the manipulation of materials at atomic, molecular and macromolecular scales, where properties differ significantly from those as a larger scale. Nanotechnology is a wreathy design characterization, production and application of structures, devices and systems by controlling shape and size at the nanometer scale. So I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about what a nanometer is, but loosely speaking people think of nanotechnologies as being a sort of a hundred nanometers or less. Along the way, we have built unashamedly beautiful buildings, two of which have won and been runner-up in the prestigious United Nations World Habitat Award, the first time an Australian building has received that international honor. We rely on older concepts of Australian architecture that are heavily influenced by the bush. All residents have private verandas which allow them to socialize outdoors and also create some defensible space between their bedrooms and public areas. We use a lot of natural or soft materials and build beautiful landscape gardens. Stephen Lowry RBS Raw was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Pendlebury, Lancashire, where he lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial districts of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his city landscapes peopled with human figures often referred to as matchstick man. He painted mysterious unpopulated landscapes, brooding portraits and the unpublished Naranet works, which were only found after his death. Those of you who've never heard of the term Neo-Latin may be forgiven for thinking it's a new South American dance craze. If you're puzzled when I tell you it has something to do with the language of Romans, take heart. Over the years, many classes who have confessed they are not really sure what it is either. Some have assumed that they are so-called Late Latin, written at the end of the Roman Empire. Others have supposed it must have been something to do with the Middle Ages. Or perhaps it's that Pseudo-Latin, which my five- and seven-year-old boys seem to have gleaned from the Harry Potter books, useful for spells and curses that they zip one another with makeshift paper ash ones. No, in fact, Neo-Latin is more or less the same as the Latin that was written in the ancient world, classic Latin. So what's so new about it?
That brings us to the CEO's second duty, building everyone or more accurately, building the senior team. All the executives report to the CEO, so it's the CEO's job to hire, fire and manage the executive team. From coaching CEOs, I actually think this is the most important skill of all. Because when a CEO hires an excellent senior team, that team can keep the company running. When a CEO hire a poor senior team, the CEO is up spending all of their time trying to do with the team and not nearly enough time trying to do with other elements of their job. The senior team can and often does develop the strategy for the company, but ultimately it's always the CEO who has the final go-no-go -no -go decision on strategy. Brooke and her colleague Mark Newman studied who swapped messages with whom on a popular online dating platform in the month of January 2014. They categorized users by desirability using PageRank, one of the algorithms behind search technology. Essentially, if you receive a dozen messages from desirable users, you must be more desirable than someone who receives the same number of messages from average users. And then they asked, how far out of their league do online daters tend to go when pursuing a partner? I think people are optimistic realists. In other words, they found that both men and women tended to pursue mates just 25% more desirable than themselves. So they're being optimistic, but they're not, they're, they're also um, taking into account their own relative position within this overall desirability hierarchy. And the study did have a few more lessons for people on the market. I think one of the take-home messages from the study is women could probably afford to be more aspirational in their mate pursuit. The Role of Family in Society Families are always related to the economy, the politics, the culture of the society. In herding societies, young people go out when they're 10 or 12 years old, and they hang out with the sheep or the goats, or whatever the herd is. That produces a kind of a loose bond between the pre-adolescents and their parents. In industrial societies, we tend to keep kids in school for longer, and then college is that point when they might break or after college, depending on what they're doing. In agrarian societies, families have lots of kids and put them to work. They structure themselves as large families and put them all together in one home. The main point is that families are not separate from the society. Families and the economy and the politics are all wrapped up all together. Now that story has been scotched as a part of a contingency planning, but it was a symptom of the dramatic turn of events in South Australia, and it flushed out other remarks from water academics and people like Tim Flannery, indicating that things were really much worse than had been foreshadowed even earlier this year. So is Adelaide, let alone some whole regions of South Australia, in serious bother? Considering that the vast amount of its drinking water comes from the beleaguered Miri, Something many of us outside the state may not have quite realized. Is there a predicament something we have to face up to as a nation? It's been a challenging decade for the music industry, with a significant decrease in sales. For years, little action was taken against illegal downloads, with few effects for downloaders. However, two new approaches are seeing positive results. 
Firstly, the industry is working with internet service providers to slow an illegal downloader's connection. Secondly, it's working directly with digital music websites. In Sweden, three out of five illegal file sharers have cut back or stopped, with half of these people moving to legal websites supported by advertisements.